Hello everyone, it's Professor Reiko here again, continuing on with our lessons on investments, and we're focusing uh, on this video on held to maturity securities. Uh, if you recall from the last video, we say we value them at amortized cost, and so, and if you remember the other two, uh, debt investments, trading securities, and available for sale, we value at fair value. So why amortized cost for held to maturity securities? Well, the reason is, if we plan on holding them to maturity, then the current fair value is irrelevant. I mean, think about it. If it's if we're not going to sell it, then we don't care what it's worth. If we're just going to hold it to the end and collect the principal back at the end of the life of the bond, then uh, fair value and you know changes in its value are irrelevant to us over the life of the bond. All right, so we're going to do an example here. So now this video is a little bit longer, uh, just because I'm going to go through you know the entire thing from start to finish. So just kind of bear with me, but I think this will provide you with a good example to look through uh, when it's time to study uh, for your exams. So we're going to have a company here. They're going to purchase two hundred thousand. So remember, in this chapter, we are the investors, so we're the ones buying it. All right. In your long-term debt chapter, you're going to be the one issuing these bonds. Okay. So depending on what your book you're using, the Kiso book uh, has uh, the long-term debt chapter before this chapter. Uh, the uh, Spiceland book, which is another popular book, has the uh, investment chapter, this chapter, before the bond issuance chapter. So depending on which book you're in, uh, the order will be a little bit different. All right, so we're purchasing 900, uh, sorry, 200,000 9% bonds. So 9% is the stated rate of the bonds. Uh, on January 1, 2016, the market rate is 11%. So we have two different rates you're given in the problem. So we'll talk about when to use each of those. Uh, they mature at the end of five years, okay? And interest is payable every six months. So semi-annually, which is common for uh, bond problems. The uh, fair value of the bonds is given as 186. All right, so notice this is the fair value of the bonds. And up top there, we just said fair value is irrelevant, which means this sentence is not used uh, in the problem. So why is it given? And why do I point that out? Because what you'll do is you'll see this in the homework. You might see it on a test. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to make sure you understand that you do not adjust to fair value. All right, so they're kind of put this in here to try to trick you in a way, uh, but make sure you realize held to maturity securities, we do not use, we don't care about fair value, we do not adjust. Now, when we get on and do our examples for trading available for sale, uh, we will adjust. All right, so the first thing I do with a bond problem, and this is the same when I'm issuing bonds or whether I'm buying bonds, is I calculate the interest payment. And the reason I do that is because the issue price of a bond is essentially the present value of its expected future cash flows. And with all bonds, you have two types of cash flows. You have the principal that you're going to receive at the end of it. That's this 200000 up here. And then you have the uh, semi-annual interest payments, which is what we'll calculate now. All right, so the reason I do this first is because this is the only time in the problem you will use the stated rate. So you take the face value of the bonds times the stated rate, and then since it's semi-annually, we multiply times 6 twelfths or one half, however you want to look at it, meaning there's two per year. All right, this works out to be $9,000. All right, and so when we are looking at our present value tables or using our calculator, this is what we refer to as an ordinary annuity. All right. So ordinary annuity means the interest payments come at the end of the period. So at the end of every six months, we get receive the interest. The other option is annuity due, and that means it would happen at the beginning. So this is an ordinary annuity. So if you're using your present value tables, make sure you use the ordinary annuity table. Uh, if you're using your calculator, make sure the annuity section is set to uh, what you will usually say end as opposed to beginning. All right, so let's scroll down here uh, before we mess with this amortization table and calculate the purchase price, All right? So I strongly encourage you to use a present value calculator. It makes your life much easier. Uh, there's basically five keys uh, on one of the rows for most calculators. So you have payment, which is the annuity, All right? So that's going to be 9000 You have the future value which is the face value of the bond. You have the N for number of periods, all right? It's five years, but it's uh, semi-annually is the period uh, that we pay interest on. So there's 10 six-month periods in the five years. And then I deals with the market rate, 
All right. Remember, the only time we use the stated rate is to calculate the interest payment. So we're done with that. So everything else will be based on 11 percent. But remember, it's 11 percent for the year. So it's 5.5 percent for the six month periods. All right. Another thing to be careful about here. Don't put 0 0.055. When you put 5.5 and hit the I key, your calculator knows you're talking about an interest rate. All right. And the fifth key or the other key is present value. So you'll hit compute and present value and it should kick out 184. 925. All right. You may be a little bit off depending, you know, rounding depending on how your calculator does it, but it should be in the ballpark of that. If you're using the present value tables, you have to calculate the present value of the payment using the ordinary annuity table and the present value of the uh, face the present value of the principal of the uh, bond using the uh, lump sum or present value of a dollar, whatever uh, it's called in your book. All right. And then you add those two together. So you can see you're going to do different present value tables, coming, finding the factor, multiplying, and then adding those two numbers together. Whereas you can see your calculator does it in one easy step. Another thing to notice here, notice this comes out as negative, uh, the 184.925. I always put uh, numbers into my calculator as it is a cash flow to me. So the 9,000 is interest I am going to receive every six months. So that's cash inflow. The 200,000 is cash I will receive at the end of the life of the bond. So that's cash inflow as well. The 184,925 is what I'm paying for the bond. So that is a cash outflow and it shows up as negative. All right, so I'll just get to a habit of doing that. So let's go on and do our journal entry, all right, for this. So we have, uh, we would debit debt investment for 184. 925 uh, and then we will credit cash for 184 925. All right, so here's where we need to be careful. If you uh, are using the Kiso book or the Spicen book, they do account for this a little bit differently. All right, so I'm, this is what I'm doing is based on the Kiso book. All right, and what this and then this next journal entry will be is Spicen. So there, there's, uh, you know, what, they're still recording an asset. Now, look, different books might use different terms. They might call this investment in bonds or investment or debt in, investment in debt or something like that. But it all means the same thing. So don't get, you know, too worried about that. All right. They're going to put this down as two hundred thousand. All right. They're going to have a discount. On debt investment. For the difference between the one eighty four nine two five and that, which is fifteen zero seven five. And then they'll have the cash for the 184 925. All right, so both are fine. All right, the, this Spiceland method here it records the gross amount. They kind of record that as the gross method. Uh, you know, they'll have a, the Spiceland book has a footnote saying that this is the gross method, and you can also do it the other way. And the Kiso book actually has a footnote saying you can do it the way Spiceland's book does it. However, Kiso book points out that the majority of people do it this way. So that's my preferred method. So if I'm teaching out of the Spiceland book, uh, you know, I'll follow the book. So, you know, kind of make sure you know what book you're using uh, and what your professor expects from you. All right. So my journal entry. So let's go and fill the table. in. All right. So on January 1, 16, that's when we uh, first get it. So notice here, total amortization. Well, we haven't done anything yet, so there's no amortization. And amortized cost would be 184.925. Now remember, amortized cost is the acquisition cost. This was defined in the first video, uh, plus the discount amortization. All right, so we know this is a discount uh, because we're paying less than the face value. So once again, the Spiceland journal entry points out that it has the discount uh, account on the books, whereas the uh, Kiso does not. Either way, you're fine. Though. So on June 30th, so the way this works is the cash received, remember, is our interest. So that's 9,000 all the way to the end. All right, we're going to receive 9,000 every six months. Interest revenue is calculated by the beginning of the period amortized cost times the market rate, which is semi-annual market rate of 5.5%. All right, so that's going to be 10,171. And then the amount that we're amortizing is just the difference between those. All right. So it's important if you can do this table, then the journal entries are easy because these fir these first three columns, those are the numbers that are going to be in my journal entry. All right. So my total amortization is now one one seven one because we just amortized that amount. Uh, and that's going to bring this now up to one eighty six zero nine six. 
Uh, it's important to note this right here, this column that I'm marking here, it's just kind of like a keep keeping a running total column. I almost think of it, uh, you know, it, it, you're, the Kiso book, uh, when they do this, they don't include that column. Okay, I do it just to kind of keep a running total, but you could obviously skip that if you want to. All right, so then we would do this, 10, 2, 3, 5. Uh, and this becomes uh, 1, 2, 3, 5. The total is now 2406. And that brings this up to 187331. And then you would just keep going and going and going. I'm going to skip this last row just for the sake of time. So let's drop in our journal entries here. So once again, these numbers. So my journal entries are on these two dates that I'm focusing on now. And so I'm going to use the numbers from those two rows. All right. So we'll scroll down just a little bit here. All right. On June 30th, uh, we are going to remember this is when we are receiving cash. So we're going to receive cash for 9000 We are going to debit our debt investment for the amortization amount. And that was 1171. And then we'll call this interest revenue of the 10,171. All right. Now, the only difference between this and the uh, Kiso book is this account right here, in, I'm sorry, in the Spiceman book would be called discount on debt investment. All right. So you can see up here, they record the discount for 15 and now they're going to start amortizing it or reducing it. And at the end of the life of the uh, bond, that discount account will be zero. All right. But here, so for think about our debt investment account. All right. We said that we defined that amortized cost is the purchase price 184.925 plus the total amortization 1171 all right so that gives me 186096 and if you look if we scroll back up here and look right here that's exactly what the table shows us all right so this method kind of follows what i think is that you know how i define amortized costs by uh, the amount of the, the value of the investment is the purchase price plus the total amortization. And we can see this playing out here. All right, let's do one more journal entry. All right, so we are go pulling from the 123116 uh, row now. And so let's scroll down here and we would have cash for 9,000. That number is the same every time. We have a debt investment for 1235. And then we'd have interest revenue for the 10,235. All right. And once again, we could add that to that T account and it would match up with that 187331 that we see in the table. All right. Now this process would now just continue on and on until the end of the life of the bonds, assuming we held them to maturity. All right. And at the end of the life of the bond, uh, the debt investment would be a full 200,000 and we've just received the cash back. All right, so what happens if we sell it before? All right, so notice what we said here. We're going to sell this on this date. So look, we almost hold it to maturity. That's what, a couple of months, two months prior to maturity. Um, the uh, Actually, let's just, I meant to change that. We'll just call this 1031 to make it exactly two months prior to uh, the maturity day of the bonds. And notice this, it says 99 and three fourths plus accrued interest, all right? When you see this, that just means percent of face value. So 99.75% of 200,000. Plus accrued interest just means all the interest up to that point we have to pay or we receive, all right? The gain or loss is based on the difference between the amortized cost and the selling price on that date, all right? So the first step we need to do is determine that amortized cost. All right, so I finished out the table, right? So, you know, basically this was the last row we did. And then if you jump ahead to the last, what the last two rows of the table would have been, this is what they would have looked like. All right. Something to point out here. Notice over here that we have uh, the, uh, that the amortized cost at the end would equal face value because we fully uh, amortized uh, the discount. All right. But anytime you're in between. So remember, we are at 10, 31, 20 which is in between those two rows in time. All right, anytime you're in between two rows, use the row after it, which will be this one, and then just prorate those numbers. So essentially, we've been four of the six months, so two thirds. So we're just gonna take two thirds of all these numbers. All right, so two thirds of 9,000 is six, 
two thirds of 10, 8, 9, 6 is 72, 64. Two thirds of the 1, 8, 9, 6 is 12, 64. All right, that would bring this number would now be 14443 14, uh, and bringing this number to 199368. All right, so remember it says the uh, gain or loss is the difference between the amortized price and selling. All right, well, there's the amortized uh, cost at that point in time. So we needed that number. All right, so if you want to think about it, the sales price is, uh, remember, they said we're selling it at 200000 but 0.9975, because we sold it at 99 and 3 fourths. That works out to be one, one ninety nine five hundred. dollars uh, The amortized cost is what we, sorry, the amortized cost is what we just calculated, and that's 199368. So you can see we're selling it for $132 more than what the, it is on our book, so we would call that a gain. All right, so let's do the journal entry to reflect this. All right, so on this would be on 10, 31, 20. All right, I kind of break this up into two entries. Uh, I kind of record the interest first because it's the exact same entry that we did for all the other interest. All right, so let's just go on and record the four months worth of the interest. So that would be the 6,000, uh, the 1, 2, 6, 4 and 7264. All right, so that gets the, you know, up at the top here. Let me scroll back up. Remember, it says up here, plus the accrued interest. All right, well, we just captured the accrued interest there. So that's included. And then the sale of the, uh, would give us cash for 199.5. Give us a gain. Remember, gains are credits, losses are debits of 132. And then we would take debt investment off the books at 199368 all right so that account would now be zero but that's exactly what we want because we just sold it and took it off our books so it should be zero i believe the kiso book shows it a different way i think they just do a debt investment for 1264 and interest revenue for 1264 and then take this 6000 and put it into the cash number uh, down here uh, that's fine too. I think this, I like this way better because it kind of follows this journal entry right here is consistent with all the other interest journal entries we've done up to this point. And then this part just captures the sale of the investment. All right. So like I said, this video is going to be a little bit longer because we are walking through one uh, from start to finish. All right. But it gives you a pretty good idea of all the different things you could have. Uh, you know, remember, anytime you're going to sell something before maturity and definitely if it's in between uh, interest payment dates, you have to do, uh, you know, this prorating step right here to where you prorate those numbers. So don't forget that. So there's a lot going on here. So make sure you go back through and watch this. Uh, and so you get comfortable with this. So if you see it on test time, uh, you got it handled. All right. So next time we'll uh, look at some of the different debt securities available for sale and trading are still coming up. And then we'll switch gears and talk about investment in equity, meaning buying stock of another company. So I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, feel free to subscribe uh, to my channel so you get updates on all the other stuff that's coming out. And I'll keep uh, moving forward with these videos. Hope you're enjoying it. Thanks.